So once again, thank you to the organizers for the possibility to give these lectures. And the main thing we were discussing was how to apply the constraints on solutions of certain problems to find, uh, obtain the solution in certain, one may say, unusual way. Um, and one constraint that we were interested in was, as we said, positivity of certain quantities. And we gave the example of constructing some, uh, the covariance or correlation matrix of uh, random variables. And we said, if we contract this uh, with some vector Xi, this is the expectation value of some per I Xi X squared, and it's always positive. And that means that this matrix is a positive semi-definite. And suppose uh, we have this, uh, some variables in the other day were some uh, Wilson expectation value of Wilson loops, but today will be something else. We have that this matrix, uh, suppose is a linear function of these variables. So we will have some A0 plus a1, uh, A, W, A. The number of variables is not related to the size of the matrix, could be a different number of arbitrary number of variables. And we want to explore the space of allowed values of my variables. One simple way is to consider linear functionals. So I sum over A, uh, alpha A, W, A. And I choose different alphas. Essentially, what I'm doing is I'm considering the space of Ws. And I'm taking a point and I'm moving along a direction and I maximize the functional. And so I reach this point, then I maximize my functional, a different functionals in different directions. And in that way, I map out the space of allowed solution. If this space is just a point, then I have my solution. But if it's uh, not a point, I need some other constraints or some other information to figure out wh where my uh, solution of interest is. And we said that this problem has a interest in finance and engineering for optimization of different things, portfolios or time or money. So since there is money involved, there is a lot of uh, software uh, for this, solving these problems. Um, although it's uh, expensive for academia, it's free. So I'm gonna give you some of the software I use. My favorite is called Mosec. Again, it's free for academia. Then there is another that I also use sometimes, Grovi. There is another called SDPA. And um, the SDPA uh, in physics was uh, taken by Simon Duffin, and he write, wrote a very nice program called SDPB, which the difference with the other programs is that uses arbitrary precision. So you can compute. Um, this is what uh, usually people use in the conformal bootstrap. Um, you can compute uh, this space of allowed solutions or with precision of 30, 40 digits which obviously are not needed for the financial or engineering applications. The price to pay that is uh, slower. So I prefer to use this type of software that is much faster. And then if you need more precision, you can use this one. One caveat, this MOSEC doesn't really solve the condition of uh, being positive semi-definite. What it does is uh, in some cases, the condition of being positive semi-definite can be reduced to the variables W belonging to the inside of a cone, for example, the Lorentz cone. And in that case, you can use this program. These other two can be used for any, um, this is called semi-definite programming for any situation where you have a matrix that depends on the, on variables and is positive semi-definite. So if you have time, I encourage you to try some of these things and see how it works. So this is more from the practical perspective. The other thing I wanted to discuss is um, the same idea of correlation functions it can be extended to positivity in quantum mechanics. So suppose we have a set of states, 
it doesn't have to be a basis, but you could have a basis, but just some arbitrary set of states, and I construct the matrix of a scalar product. So I construct this matrix. Now I do the same as we just did for the correlation functions, but these are complex. So I'm going to put a complex vector. I sum over i and j. Um, if I sum over i here and j, what you get is uh, clearly the norm of this linear combination. Norm squared, and this is positive. So the matrix of overlaps is positive, semi-definite. And this is a constraint that happens in any quantum system. In particular, uh, consider a quantum field theory and consider scattering. Um, uh, we're going to start with the subspace. I'm going to scatter uh, for this example that I'm going to work today, uh, two particles. So I scatter one particle against another. And let's consider time. So initially, I have two particles scattering. And then this state evolves, and in the final state, I mean, this doesn't mean anything, just some evolution. And in the final state, I can have a lot of two particles or more. I can have a, some complicated state. And in the Heisenberg picture, this state uh, is called the in state. Um, uh, at the end, I want to see the probability of finding two particles outgoing. So I will construct states that in time plus infinity corresponds to two particles outgoing. And for that, initially, they have to be some complicated states, which will be like the time reversal of the other. And this will be called the out state in the Heisenberg picture. And the overlap between the some given in state and some given out state gives me the probability that let's say a two particle state initially evolves into or the amplitude that evolves into a two particle state at the end and that's called the s matrix in the uh, subspace of two particle states and i can construct the s matrix in any subspace okay so this is some uh, i mean not doing very formal i guess there are some more issues here but basically we can construct the s matrix in this way and so now I'm going to take these in states and out states as my basis, and I'm going to construct the overlaps. So I'm going to construct the in states and the out states, and in states and out states. And uh, in state within state will give me identity, and uh, out state within state we said give me the S matrix. This is the same but the dagger because it's just in without and this identity. And this matrix should be positive semi-definite. So we get a constraint on the S matrix, which should be positive semi-definite for the S matrix in a subspace. We can do this later. I mean, that's the same. We know that the S matrix is unitary. And using unitarity of the S matrix, one can derive the same condition in a subspace. One uh, thing I'm not going to use and was discussed by Penedones, for example, and collaborators is you can do the same uh, simple generalization uh, by putting in out and then putting some operator, for example, a current acting on the vacuum. And this still two particle states. And here we have a vacuum or dagger. So this will be one. S dagger S1, and here we will, uh, sorry, this will be in like this. And this will be in state O uh, vacuum and out O vacuum. And this will be O dagger O vacuum. And the same here, and this, uh, these uh, matrix elements are called uh, form factors. For example, O could be a, a current, so these are will be electromagnetic form factors of uh, two particle states of, of a particle where the, that if I have two of them, I give me the form factor. Um, these are part of the spectral function of the operator O. So here, this matrix still should be positive semi-definite. 
and you can do this bootstrap uh, to include not only the S matrix but also form factors. So it's very simple idea that the um, as we just said the uh, overlap the matrix of overlaps is always positive semi-definite but it leads to some non-trivial constraints. The easiest of all here is when the, I use other quantum numbers. For example, today I'm going to work in two dimensions, but in three dimensions, three plus one dimensions, I can use angular momentum. I can use isospin um, in such a way that after putting a well-defined angular momentum, well-defined isospin, conserve quantities, I have only one two-particle state. If I have only one two-particle state, this, uh, these are just numbers. And you get that uh, the matrix 1S is, is conjugate 1 is positive semi-definite, which means that the mole square of S is less or equal than 1. And that means that if I have a two-particle state with well-defined quantum numbers that completely characterizes, then it goes to that same two-particle state, and then the S matrix is some complex number there, or goes to multi-particle states. And the mole square of that uh, probability of going to the same state should be less or equal than one because the total probability adds up to one. And that's the most basic thing I'm going to use. Okay, so what do we want to compute? Well, we want to compute the S matrix for some model and we uh, these talks are supposed to be about QCD, but I'm going to consider a two-dimensional system, which is uh, the nonlinear sigma model that has some uh, characteristics can be thought as some uh, toy model for QCD. So let me remind you what that is. So if I have a vector of uh, n components, uh, which has a unit length. So you can think of this as a magnetization, for example, that there is some spontaneous symmetry breaking, the modulus is fixed, so I can rescale it to one, and this vector can fluctuate. So this has n components, so this will uh, apparently describe n minus one Goston bosons um, that parameterize sphere. And this a here is a, a zero or one, so I'm working in two dimensions. However, uh, in two dimensions, we know there is no spontaneous symmetry breaking like this. And um, Polyakov uh, showed that this model is asymptotically free, so this coupling goes to zero at infinity but at the same time it grows in the infrared so at low energy uh, the theory instead of being so this instead of describing n minus one massless bosons the symmetry is restored and the vacuum is has a on symmetry and there are n uh, develops a mass gap so there are n massive uh, scalars so it has a lot of so qcd should be the same so at low energy, we should have some massless pions, but of course, it's uh, way more complicated. In this case, the scattering of these uh, n massive scalars uh, that appear at low energy can be computed exactly, and that was done by Samologikov and Samologikov using integrability and the Jan Bachter equation. That's the main thing: integrability. And today, I'm going to show how to compute that S matrix without using integrability or uh, the Jan Bachter equation, but we're going to do it numerically. One thing, this is just for note, this, uh, the mass scale is related to some renormalization scale, and in the large n limit, it has this exponential uh, behavior. I think Richard Brower was saying that yesterday about the QCD. But that's only in the large n limit. Today, we're not interested in the large n limit. We're going to do this for any n. Okay, so what's the S matrix here that we want to compute? Well, we uh, have some index. Uh, well, okay, maybe I'm going to mix it. But I'm going to call now the, well, let's call it this mu. So I'm going to call the index of uh, uh, N A. A is going to go from 1 to N. And so I'm going to take a matrix, sorry, a particle with uh, index A and momentum P1. And I'm going to collide it with a particle with momentum B, sorry, with label B and momentum P2. So this is energy P1. P1 is just one dimensionally here, so I put it as a vector. But... So we're in the center of mass, so we have that. 
And then uh, we will have some final particles. So the, by, by energy momentum conservation in two dimensions, we can we have to have basically the same momentum. So the only thing that can happen is the labels of the particles can be uh, interchanged. So this is my initial state and this is my final state. And this matrix can be written uh, to go from A, B to C, D. And basically there are three things that can happen. The A can be go to C and the B go to D. And that's called the transmission. So if A is to go to C, delta A, C, delta B, D. And then you can have reflection if uh, uh, B is C and A is D. And in uh, this quantum relativistic theory, you can also have annihilation. So if A is B, they are the same particle. If they are on antiparticle here, they can annihilate each other and create a pair delta CD. So there are three, very, three S matrices called the transmission and reflection and annihilation, and they are function of the momentum. Now, to be more precise, we can define the Mandelstam variables, and they are similar as in the higher dimension. So S variable is the total center of mass energy squared, so it's P1 plus P2 squared. And here this the P1 and minus P1 cancel, so this is 4U1 squared. Then there is U, which is this, some depends on how you want to define this, but I'm gonna define P, one minus P3 squared, but in this two dimensional setup, this is zero because P1 and P3, ah, well, I didn't call this, uh, let's call this P4 and this P3, hopefully you can see down there. So P1 and P3 are the same, so this is zero. This is not the case, obviously, in higher dimension. And T, I'm gonna define P2 minus P3 squared. And if you do P2 minus P3, the energy cancels, so you get minus 2P1. And the, this square is relativistic, so it's 0 minus uh, 4P1 square. Uh, so I don't want to change space, so let me see if that fits there. And this is energy square minus uh, mass square, so this is just a 4M square minus S. So in two dimensions, there is only one independent Mandelstam variable, S. Um, this transmission, reflection, and annihilation are all functions of S. So I have three functions of S that I want to, to determine. So that's basically the... Ah, sorry, and uh, these are bosoms, so I forgot here I should put... Uh, uh, I should put the plus the P3, P4 interchange and C and D interchange. Right? C, D, and uh, P3, P4. That doesn't play any big role here. But, uh, so, so I still want to find the three functions of uh, one variable. Um, okay, so I'm going to change page now, but uh, remember this definition. And then the next symmetry I want to consider is crossing symmetry. So I'm going to do an example. And uh, for the students, I leave this as an exercise. Uh, for the other case, so suppose I have a particle with label one that collides with a particle with label two, and uh, I consider the transmission, so I'm going to say that this goes like this. So the particle with label one goes through, and this also goes through. And now I'm going to interchange this is particle one, uh, two, this is uh, three, and th no, this was four, and this was three. And remember, crossing symmetry, I have to interchange, take one particle from the final state and put it as an antiparticle with opposite momentum, energy momentum in the initial state. So I'm going to put here a minus P3 at label one, and here I'm going to put the same one. And here, I'm, well, this I'm going to leave it here. And here I'm going to put the particle one with momentum minus P1. And then uh, this is the crossing symmetric and can be computed from the same four point function. So it's related to the previous one. The difference is that S now uh, is P2, is the sum of the initial state, P2, but minus P3 squared. So it's what used to be three, uh, sorry, T. 
Now, when one and two collide and give you this steel has level one and level two, this is the transmission. Um, the consequence is that the transmission evaluated at S should be equal to the transmission evaluated at the S tilde, but that's a four M squared minus S. So that's a condition for um, the transmission. Now, uh, 4m squared minus s is not physical, so this requires an analytic continuation of the transmission. An exercise, as I said, for students is to show that the annihilation uh, maps to the reflection in this way. The other thing we said is that we wanted to have a matrices uh, sorry, states with well-defined quantum numbers. So the initial state, I can take the quantum numbers of the initial state, which are in a ON representation, two vectors, and I can construct the, with two vectors, I can construct the symmetric traceless, the, what I call it, plus, the anti-symmetric and the trace, which is called sometimes the isoscalar. And again, I'll leave it for the, the students. So I'm going to suppose you consider the isoscalar. So isospin zero, that will be a normalized state like this. One, one, plus two, two, up to N, N. And so if I scatter this state, and I use uh, the S matrix that I had before, you can see that this becomes a transmission plus reflection, plus n times annihilation. And the important, this I'm going to call SI, and the important point is that the modulus of SI squared is less or equal than one. And I can construct also uh, the S plus minus, but uh, scattering all the, 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 the isospin eigenstates as ST plus minus SI and you get that S plus is less or equal than one, and S minus, sorry, S minus is less or equal than one. Okay, so this seems to be a lot of formulas, um, but what do we do with this? Well, we need one extra ingredient, which is um, analyticity. And that's, uh, remember last time, we were saying that analytic functions are sort of rigid, so it's hard to change them, because if you change them locally, you have to change them everywhere. So in particular, uh, analytic functions that obey this type of condition, the, the, these are very strong constraints. So you, if you have something bigger than one, you can just locally make it smaller or something because uh, you change the function everywhere. It's still, obviously there are many solutions, but that will be one of the conditions. So we have uh, this uh, is what I call positivity. So we have our positivity conditions. Then we have crossing, which was this relation between uh, S and 4M squared minus S, uh, values of the functions. And uh, finally, we have analyticity. So let me uh, see what analyticity is. Um, so uh, for that, I'm going to consider, as we said, the transmission, uh, the annihilation, transmission, and reflection as functions of uh, S, but I'm, S demand the standard variable, but I'm going to consider S as a complex variable. So I'm going to consider the complex plane S. And uh, the question is, what uh, are the singularities of these functions? Now, this is not easy to answer. So the general case is that, or the general idea is to assume what's called maximal analyticity. And that means that the only singularities are come from some physical requirements. And if there is uh, no physical requirement, then we assume that there is no singularity. And what are the physical requirements? Well, uh, the first, let me say that if I have 4m squared, that's uh, the total, remember, S is 4 energy squared, where energy is the energy of the particle. So the energy of the particle has to be m or larger. So this is the minimum value that it can have. So this uh, part of the real line corresponds to physical values of S. So this is called the physical line. Now, uh, if I consider k, k is the momentum, uh, can be seen as S minus 4m squared over 
So, uh, so here going from above, uh, here to slightly below corresponds to from k goes to minus k. And if I think about a wave function like uh, uh, ingoing momentum, and then I have some outgoing momentum. And as we know here, I can put the phase shift. So the outgoing wave has some phase shift. Going k to minus k essentially gives me e to the i k r e to the 2i delta L, e to the minus i k r. So if I take this common factor, you see that they go from phase shift delta L to minus delta L. So essentially, the going from above to below the real axis is a, like a time reversal, and there is a jump. So here there is a, a cut where the analytic S matrix goes from a, some value to its complex conjugate that corresponds to change in momentum k to minus k keeping the energy the same. Now, if I go here, I'm, I'm gonna have a K a purely imaginary because S will be less than four M squared. When K is purely imaginary, this become exponentials. Um, if I have a pole here, what it happens is that you have just decaying exponentials that corresponds to, the, to a bound state. So if these particles have bound states, they appear as poles in this region. And then remember that we have symmetry uh, S to four minus S. So that means that there is another cut and sometimes called the T cut here. Uh, so there is a symmetry around the point uh, S equals two M squared. So this uh, theory uh, doesn't have any bound state. That's an assumption. So there are no poles. And so what we said, maximum analyticity tells us that, okay, there are no bound states, there are no poles, there are these two cuts because of a cross, because of what I just said here of the interchange time reversal and the, all these are related to two particle states and the, the T cross uh, channel. So I'm gonna assume that these three functions are analytic functions of S with this analytic structure. And on the physical line, I can do these linear combinations, uh, SI, uh, S plus and S minus, and I, the modus square has to be less or equal than one for I, for plus, and for minus. And so now I converted the physical problem of computing these functions into a mathematical problem, which is I have three analytic functions, SI, ST, SR, or this SI plus and minus. On, they have this analytic structure with two cuts. On the cut, the modus square has to be less or equal than one for I plus and minus and they obey this uh, crossing, which st of four, oops, sorry, st of four m squared minus s is the same as st of s, and s annihilation of four m squared minus s is uh, s annihilation, s reflection of s, and then si is uh, st plus sr plus nsa, and s plus minus r is uh, the T plus minus SR. And the question is, what are the possible analytic functions that satisfy this? Notice that this is very generic, so we didn't use much, uh, so we use the, all the constraints that we have from quantum field theory, but uh, still there seems to be like a lot of possible uh, answers. So the other thing is, how do I want to parameterize this space of solutions? So what I'm gonna do, is because of this symmetry, the crossing symmetry, if I uh, take this point, um, which is, there is no pole here, I'm just uh, indicating a point for uh, where I want to evaluate the functions, you can see that the reflection and the annihilation are the same. So at this point, uh, I have essentially two numbers. One is the transmission at 2m squared, and the other is the, um, annihilation or reflection of 2m squared. Um, the mathematical question I'm gonna ask is what are the possible values of these two quantities uh, under these very general conditions? And we can plot that and I'm gonna now uh, give an idea of how to do that. But first uh, let me sketch the answer. So hopefully the mathematical problem is uh, clear and uh, Again, uh, I'm going to give later some numerical ways to do this. But the, the answer to this question is as follows. 
Uh, suppose uh, I have the transmission here and remember a 2m squared at the symmetric point and here we have a annihilation equals to reflection. Um, uh, there is a point here that corresponds to a free theory. The free theory, uh, there is only transmission. There is no reflection or annihilation. And uh, let me sketch this um, picture like this. This is not exactly what it is, but I'm going to tell you now how to get this initial picture. So one thing one can find uh, easily, and this is the next calculation, is that all the possible values are contained. Uh, this is one here are contained in this region. And if you do numerical, this can be done analytically in a simple way, but if you do it numerically, you find some, uh, some, come on, okay, actually, some, I'm gonna show the picture later when I go to slides, but sorry, some region like this. And so here there is a vertex corresponding to the free theory, but if one looks carefully, there is a vertex here. So if I zoom here, I see like a little kink. And okay, it's not completely clear why, but <coughs> if you look at this kink, it corresponds exactly to the uh, integrable ON model to the S matrix that was found by Samorochiko and Samorochiko. Let me emphasize that if you look at, uh, so this is just a two values, but once you have those two values, uh, you have all the functions uh, S, T, S, A, and S, R of S. So you have the full S matrix numerically. And it compares very well with the analytical one. And so this is the case I said before. So you have a whole space, which is not very, it's two dimensional. So well, there is an infinite dimension, but I have a cross section, two dimensional cross sections of allowed values. And uh, from those, I have to figure out which ones are the ones I'm interested in. So if they have some way to figure out that is in this direction, then I can find the, that particular point. And each of these points here corresponds to a full S matrix. And so we uh, thought that this was a general picture that you have the allowed space of S matrix as matrices and in the boundary of that space, there are some distinguished points, um, for example, vertices that correspond to interesting theories. So there is another other points here. For example, this point corresponds to another integrable theory, but in there is no king there. So it's not always that there is a king when there is an interesting theory. So this is kind of the general picture that we want to push about the, the this S matrix bootstrap. It's a new version. This idea was started by Paulo Penedones, Toledo, Van Ries, and Vieira, and it builds up on the old bootstrap. So next time I'm gonna describe uh, how to use this in three plus one dimensions, which is what people were doing in the 50s and 60s. 70s also, I guess, and uh, but today I'm just going to concentrate on this uh, two-dimensional problem. So, uh, and this is kind of the modern version of the bootstrap, where you don't expect to have uh, the S matrix completely determined by the symmetries, but you expect to have a space of allowed S matrices, and then use some physical input or some other ideas to find uh, the distinguished point that corresponds to your particular theory. Okay, so this is um, this part. So now I'm gonna try to show you how to constrain this this uh, this space. In particular, there is this nice way to find this outer region that you can shrink and numerically to become the the allowed space. Okay, so hopefully this is clear. So we have three functions, analytic functions with some. Uh, particular complex uh, structure which is just have two cuts. Um, these functions uh, satisfy crossing and unitarity. So the model square has to be less or equal than one on the physical line. And when do S to four minus S, the, so I, if I consider this transmission, reflection, and annihilation as, let me call some index, I don't know, but well, let's call it A again, but, a can be S plus and minus. What we have is S plus of uh, 4M squared minus S. 
is some matrix crossing matrix S C A B S B of S. And this matrix can be done can be obtained by going rewriting this in terms of annihilation transmission and reflection. Okay, so let's try to see one approach to solve this problem. Uh, of what are the possible allowed values uh, of this uh, of this S matrix? I don't know why I switch colors. Let me go back to this. So, uh, so suppose I have uh, my complex plane S, and what I'm gonna do is now is um, what we like to call generalized dispersion relations. It's a simple observation, but uh, dispersion relations have been around for a long time. But for some reason, what I'm gonna say now, it was not uh, discussed. Well, I don't know why, but it's I, we're gonna see it's very simple. I'm gonna choose m squared to be one, so I'm gonna just call this four instead of four m squared. And I mean particularly interested on the value of these analytic functions uh, at this s equals to two. And so how do you do the traditional, well, let's say dispersion relation? Well, you take a little counter around that, and I'm gonna say that my supposition is s naught, which is equal to two. And I'm gonna say that uh, my S matrix or any function at S naught by the theorem of residues is two pi i integral of S A of S, oops, of S divided S minus S naught. I think I changed for uh, DS. That's a simple thing. And then we deform the contour to a contour like this to infinity. Now there is another assumption, which is uh, what the value at infinity is. So I'm going to assume that at infinity S goes to constant or to zero, I don't know, so that this, uh, well, to zero, so that the integral around infinity vanishes. But uh, if not, you have to do what's called subtraction. So it doesn't matter. So you divide by some S minus two or something. But uh, so now I just want to derive this dispersion relation with the simplest assumption, which is that the integral at infinity goes away. And then what you get is that uh, you have these integrals which are around the contour. Um, so what you get is this integral around the cut, sorry, integral over the cut of the jump because you are integrating above and below, but in different directions. So you get the jump and they say x minus x naught dx and x I integrate from minus infinity to zero and from four to infinity. Now the integral over the left cut, I can use crossing to relate to the integral over the right hand side cut. Um, that means that I can evaluate the, the function at any point here in the complex plane, just by evaluating the jump on the uh, physical line. And that's what's called a dispersion relation. Now the observation that I uh, wanted to make, which is kind of trivial, but uh, as I said, for some reason it's not discussed too much, is that to deform the contour, I can I only use that the function is analytic in this region, except on the cuts, and that means that I don't have to use this function one over s minus s naught uh, here in the integral. I can use any function k of s that has a simple pole with residue one at two, but it could have these cuts. So it could have a, some function with cuts because uh, it doesn't matter if K has cuts, I can still deform the contour. Um, so now I'm gonna write this uh, generalized dispersion relation if you want with a arbitrary um, function K, which is analytic and uh, in the complex plane with possible cuts between four and infinity, minus infinity and zero, and a pole at two or arbitrary S naught with residue one. Okay, so let's do that. So hopefully it's clear what I'm doing. So I'm gonna consider now some function as we said before, which is a sum of some, arbit well, maybe let's go with, uh, some vector v 
and the matrices is matrices evaluated at s and this is the thing i'm going to maximize now so i want to find the maximum of this f and by choosing different vectors v i can map all the possible allowed values of these functions s and this would be sorry s equals to two here and i'm going to say that this uh, but what i just said is the integral of this k a of s s a of s and k f of k a of s now has pole at s equals to two with residue uh, v a now instead of one so that i get this and can have cuts but uh, i want to deform the contour actually now i can avoid subtraction if this doesn't go to zero i can take k that go to zero but Anyway, so I have this uh, integral above the cut minus the integral below the cut. And then I have the same uh, for the cut from minus infinity to zero. So I'm not going to do this. Uh, you can give it as an exercise that this here by using S goes to 4 minus S. I can convert the integral on the left cut into the integral or same integral on the right cut. However, for that, I need to have some crossing for k because s obeys crossing, but k in principle doesn't obey anything. And what one can see is that k has to obey this basically the same crossing, but with the minus sign. The minus sign is so that the two things add and they don't cancel. So times CBA. So this is the same crossing matrix. The crossing matrix square is one because if I cross twice, I get the same. So in the end, what you get is that the two things add up and you get the, sorry, just this integral. The other thing is that we said that the S matrix above and below the cut are complex conjugate of each other. I'm going to require the same for k. So k is an arbitrary function up to the condition of the residues and so on. Uh, and so I can impose extra condition. And if I impose that condition, then this will be the complex conjugate of this. And that means that the difference is just twice the imaginary part times i. So I will get twice integral between four and infinity the imaginary part of k a is k a s a so this is a uh, typical of the dispersion relation the only difference is that before this used to be one s minus s naught and now is a much larger space of functions that can have cuts and that just allowed me to evaluate my function. So hopefully, I mean, I was being a little quick, but there is no mystery here. We just deform the contour. We get an integral above the cut minus below the cut. And we have two cuts, but the two cuts are related by crossing. So in the end, I get the jump on one cut and the jump is just in the imaginary part. So we get this relation. Um, so I'm gonna go now to the next page. And so what we obtain is that this uh, linear combination of some constant vector with the matrices evaluated at the symmetric, uh, the S matrices or S functions, if you want to call them, is one over pi, or two over pi, integral four and infinity, imaginary part of Ka SA. Um, these are evaluated on the physical line now, on, from four to infinity. And now I'm going to use, okay, some obvious identity that the imaginary part is less or equal than the modulus. So, so this is less or equal than the modulus of Ka times the modulus of Sa. And now is where the positivity, what we call constraint comes in. The modulus of Sa is less or equal than one because we're using the A labels, uh, so A labels the isospin, the isoscalar, the symmetric and anti-symmetric representations, 
there is only one state of two particle state with those quantum numbers. So it can only go into itself or higher number of particles. So the mole square has this or equal than one because I'm evaluating for uh, energies, uh, physical energies. So this is less or equal than one. And so this is less or equal than two pi for an infinity modulus of Ka. And so uh, Ka, we said is an infinite dimensional space of functions that have cuts from minus infinity to zero, four to infinity, have residue Va at two, and then away and some sort of anti-crossing and uh, real analyticity is called when the conjugate, uh, if I evaluate at the conjugate point, I get the conjugate function. But in that space, I can uh, minimize this, this F. So uh, F will be less or equal than the minimum over all functions Ka uh, uh, of this integral. And so the one way to do the numerics is simply to take all the functions and parameterize it in some way and try to find the minimum. And that will uh, give me uh, the region. But uh, what I was promising is there is some nice analytic way. So once again, I leave it for an exercise. Uh, you can take these functions, uh, VA divided S minus two. This has a pole at two with residue VA but uh, so that the thing goes away at infinity, I'm gonna add this uh, this function, square root. So this has a cut for S bigger than four and for S negative, it still maintains the crossing anti-symmetry. So if I do S to four minus S, I get a minus sign. This two here is so that the residue at two is still one. And so the exercise that I'm proposing is you take this Ka and you put it here, and you evaluate this integral. Um, what you get is that the F is just less or equal than the sum over A modulus of VA. And if from there, uh, with some uh, little, some sort of work, you get this uh, polyhedron that I was describing before. So you get this, uh, this outer uh, lines like that. And so, so that can be done analytically with very little effort. Um, then uh, numerically, you can uh, shrink the region uh, or you can go from the inside. So you can propose different S matrices. And as you increase the space of uh, S matrices that you cover, you get uh, bigger and bigger regions by doing what I just said with the dispersion relations that's called uh, mathematically the dual problem you come from outside. So you have a bigger region that you shrink by uh, taking more and more uh, functions K because you're trying to uh, minimize the this. So if I put uh, more and more Ks, I shrink the space. Okay, so that's uh, what I wanted to say here uh, for the, well, the, and now I'm gonna go to slides, but uh, this is a generalized dispersion relations. You can also do them in three plus one dimensions. We're going to discuss that next time. Okay, so let me know. Uh, I don't know if there are any questions now before we uh, switch. Yeah, I, I have a question. Yes. Uh, uh, so this uh, choice of the function Ka, uh, is it unique? I mean, in some sense or... Uh... Yeah, I can have something else there, some polynomial modification, and perhaps the. But Ka be is a general, uh, so Ka is a general function. I mean, with has the cuts like, ah, you yes. mean this Ka? Yes, this yes. Ka is just an example. This Ka is an example. That was an example. Okay, okay. Ah, yes, because okay. I yeah, so I want to minimize overall Ka's, but the minimum is always smaller than for a given Ka. So I take this given Ka and I get uh, this, uh, yes. I get this outer region, but that's not the minimum. But I know yes. that my region will be contained there. So I simply, I, I have a very simple way to get a bound. 
Now I start okay. putting polynomials as you this as you mentioned. Uh, you can do a map to a circle and put polynomials. Uh, numerically, you can keep finding better and better cases that shrink uh, the region to this. Now, uh, one question is if the minimum is unique. That's a different question. Uh, but yes, the minimum, uh, you get just some function. And there is one um, theorem, uh, how is it called, based on, uh, well, so there is a kind of famous theorem of function analysis that I forget the name now. But uh, from that theorem, you can see that this is, uh, this was called the gap here closes. So the minimum overall case is equal to the actual value or maximum value that F can have. So if you find the minimum for K, you actually found the, find the boundary of the space. And there is a nice formula that the, when you minimize and you find your minimum, you can compute the S matrix from the K by doing this. So, the, so but that's the minimum K, the minimum. I don't know how to call it the minimizer or something, the, the minimum. So the one that minimizes the this functional, from there you can compute this math. Yes, this K was just a simple example that allows you to do the integral analytically and already gives a non-trivial bound, but it's a bound, it's not the tight bound. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Some I mean, you must, goes the other way. Right? Sorry. you must have some function space that you have to cover, right? I mean, yes, yes. So, what there's there's some statement on the full set of functions that you're. Well, the the set of functions are the analytic functions uh, with possible cuts and uh, pole here, and uh, away cro anti crossing and. Uh, no, that tells uh, me that tells me a particular function that you can choose. But you said you would get to the minimum, and you must have to have some completeness statement that you'll get the actual exact answer, right? Yeah, yeah. So the thing we do is, uh, so you can do a map from, uh, so you can take, I think, W is square root of S minus square root of 4 minus S. Uh, and this, uh, in the space W, this uh, map to a circle. Uh-huh. And this is a cut here. Uh, this is one cut. So this is four and infinity. So uh -huh. the these two are the upper and lower region of the cut, and the T cut goes on this side. Right. So oh, if I... I want functions analytic here, I'm gonna put just polynomials of W. And uh, then I'm gonna add the one over W. I think the two goes to zero, so I will have a pole. Mm -hmm. um, then I put polynomials, uh, so I put, let's say, a polynomial of order 20, so mm -hmm. I have 20 coefficients, and I minimize over those 20 coefficients. Now, this is numerical, so the more coefficients I put, the better the answer I get. So the polynomials need to be a complete uh, map to the complex functions on that sphere, circles? Ah, uh, yes, the uh, complex functions on a, on a disk, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. polynomials mm -hmm. form a basis. So, okay. uh, so if I have uh, the higher order the polynomial, the better I do. But yeah, this okay. is becomes numerical now, so yeah. uh, I can. I mean, uh, I mean, by the way, a common version variable to use is not s; it's called new, so that you make it symmetric from the beginning. You call ah, it. Ah, yes. Yeah, so new yeah. is symmetric s for new yeah, is so s minus two, a, and then you keep the symmetry from the beginning. And then you uh, yeah, so that usually, so the next time I'm going to discuss the forward amplitude. Yeah. Um, yeah, people and like then, and then you use functions that are even and odd. So you have the right cut and the left cut as even and odd pieces. That's a very common trick. Yeah, yeah so here this W to minus W is a crossing symmetry. So here you have also right. even, uh, so odd, that's even because and odd polynomials of W. In the cross channel, it's bosons. So that's just um, symmetry, yeah. Yes, yes. So there is so one, yeah, a new, I think, is a, a, a T minus U, right? That's, what That's right. Called. So with identical particles, that always gives you symmetry. Uh, yes. So, um, yes. Yeah, so that's a, yeah. So in two dimensions, it's easier if you want, but uh, yeah, I, I know what you're saying. Two in any dimension. 
It's, it, uh, yeah, well, here U is zero, so. It's always these statistics. <laughs> yes, yes. It's changing. Oh, that's fine. Yes, yes. Any further questions in the room at the moment? I'm not seeing any. So let me know. Uh, I show you the actual plots. Uh, just a second, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm trying to share the PowerPoint. It has uh, appeared for us. Uh, okay, thank you. So um, these are some references. So as I said, Paulo Pereira, Toledo, Van Ries, and Vieira, Vieira, they wrote a series of three papers where they took the ideas of the old S matrix bootstrap and combined them with the new ideas of the conformal bootstrap and they proposed this uh, revival. And then some of papers I wrote uh, related to this that I kind of been di discussing. And uh, oh, sorry, I don't know how much I have a few minutes, right? I don't know. Um, I have like 15 minutes maybe, but so this is a little bit of uh, where this comes from. So in the old days, uh, people wanted to study uh, bootstrap to understand uh, Mason physics, as uh, Robert was saying. And um, from here, these ideas, the uh, string theory came about and many other things. And uh, one thing we're trying to do now is to revive this uh, idea of computing the S matrix from all symmetries. The main thing I want to see a difference is that in those days, they thought that the putting all the constraints will give you a unique S matrix, but now the approach is somewhat different. Now we believe there is a quantum field theory underlying this. Before they didn't know what was the, if there was or not an underlying theory, they just wanted to use S matrix. Here we think there is a, we, okay, not we think, but the approach is we have a quantum field theory and we want to compute the S matrix in a different way that it doesn't involve some in all the Feynman diagrams. And the way, presumed way that still not working completely, I mean, but it works in two dimensions, as I just mentioned, is you put all the constraints, you get a space of allow functions. And from that space of allow functions, you use extra, so it's not unique. So you get a whole infinite dimensional space, which is smaller, but still large. And from there, you have to pick up the RS matrix by using some extra input or some experimental values or something. And uh, what I was doing, so this is a general kind of sketch. There is an infinite dimensional space that I uh, described this, this as this blob. And we found in two dimensions that this blob has different vertices corresponding to free theory, the integral OL model, uh, there is some other model uh, that has zero transmission and presumably there may be other physically interesting theories. So you don't get just a unique theory, but you get some nice theory at some nice theories at some particular points. Now, this is just to show you this kind of non-trivial function. So if you use this S Mandelstam variable and you convert it into theta, the scattering matrix is quite non-trivial. It involves all these gamma functions. So, uh, and, but okay, this is just to, to show you what kind of functions you have. Um, this is the plot that I was mentioning before. So this is the transmission, the allow values of the uh, annihilations and reflection at S equals to two, um, the transmission. Um, uh, this uh, shaded region is numerical, it can be very precise, so the error is kind of the less than the width of this line. So this is the possible values under the general constraints of analyticity, crossing, and uh, unitarity. And here this uh, black dot is the free theory. 
This has symmetry S to minus S, so you get a symmetric theory, a symmetric plot. This uh, blue dot is the integral nonlinear sigma model. I said there is a kink, but you have to zoom in into the picture to see the kink. So it's there. There is some here, uh, this uh, yellow dot is uh, correspond to constant S matrices, so you can satisfy all the constraints with constant S matrices, but this doesn't saturate unitarity, that's interesting. And there is another integrable model here that Vieira and uh, Lucia Cordova found uh, by these methods, although uh, it turns out that it was already known from before, although a bit obscure, but existed there. And this is the comparison between the numerics, which are the, the dots, and the analytics, which are the, the lines. So here we are not uh, obtaining anything new, because, but that was the purpose. So we wanted first to reproduce something that was known, but uh, with this simple numerics. So you get a good comparison. This is n equals to four, and you can do n equals to 20. You can go like large n, n equals 100 and you are doing numerics uh, so compare it with the analytics let me show you the numerics because okay this is a matlab but the only thing i want to show you here is that i have a, a, a set of uh, it might not be completely clear what i'm doing here but let me just show you that i have this uh, real part of the S matrices, and I'm saying that the modus square is less or equal than one, that is instruction. And this is analyticity. So this takes the real part, applies some kernel, and gives me the imaginary part. So, uh, and this real part and imaginary part is just a vector that gives me the values at some points at the boundary of the disk. And this kernel is simply just a matching a polynomial and relating real and imaginary parts. So you put these constraints, and then you just uh, plot the S matrix. And with this simple program that, okay, if you, you can type it in MATLAB and see exactly what it does, but I just want to show you it's very short and that computes the, all these S matrices. So, but just from those constraints. So it's very simple numerics. And these are these uh, different vertices in uh, plotting them in the between zero and four, so in the imaginary or in the unphysical region, and transmission, reflection, and analyticity. And these are the different uh, things we found: the free theory, the nonlinear sigma model, and basically when you plot in this region, there is no distinction between the analytics and the numerics. This is the one that has zero transmission and corresponds to these different points I was showing in the plot. I, I have a question. Yes. Can I ask? Uh, yes, of course. So, uh, so if you go a few, I mean, if you look at this region, I was just wondering about uh, the following point that we know that uh, you must be having the O4 Sigma model in this uh, uh, class O4, in, in yes. This, uh, yes, O4 is there, which which is the SU2 chiral model, right? Uh, uh, so I was just wondering about all... SU and chiral models, whether, how would you know that they are there or not there, SU and chiral model? Uh, okay, I mean, that, that will be has a different symmetry. Uh, so yeah, this doesn't include these chiral models. I think these are non-chiral, but... Uh, but uh, uh, you didn't use any of the symmetries of the ON model when you discussed the S-matrix, unless I have missed something. Uh, well, no, I use it for the crossing. I mean, I use it. So for N appears in crossing because... Oh, I see, I see, I you see. Have I see. A, I see. Uh, yeah, you have okay. the okay. isoscalar is transmission plus reflection plus n is mm -hmm. annihilation. So the mm -hmm. so the mm -hmm. yes, yeah, this is I don't remember if uh, this probably n equals to six. So the space depends on the value of n. N is in the crossing matrix. Yes. So, so that's how we get so. this n equal four that you mentioned, but you also get different values of n is in the crossing. So, so the natural question is, how would one tackle the 
uh, SU and chiral models, which are very rich and also asymptotically free. Yes, I don't know if somebody did that or but yeah, you have to write again the functions. <laughs> I don't know if you have more. Uh... Okay, yes, yeah, so I don't know now exactly how one should do it, but the, the, the general recipe again is to have the the a set of S matrices, which in this case are functions of S, and you have the crossing and unitarity, and then you have some good parameter, for example, the value here, <laughs> and you plot the allow values and see there. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, one would have to sit down and look at that. I don't know. But that's the general. I mean, there is many, many models that have been done. I don't know if the current model was done like this. But uh, I mean, in these recent years, uh, people look at a lot of the 2D models in this way. But uh, yeah, I don't know, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, unfortunately, I don't have a watch here. So let me know when I'm supposed to finish. Man. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I mean, more. just I, this is very beautiful, and I know it's hard to go to harder problems, but could you make any progress on the Atuft model, the large N QCD in two dimensions? There you know that the uh, there's no cut, oh. it's meromorphic. It's a little bit more like the old bootstrap, uh, where you assume that in modern language it's large N. And, uh, you know, it, it has. Um, it's two dimensional and it still has the same uh, uh, yes, sort of yes. analytic structure, except that there's no cut, there's poles. And of course, you know the solution. I mean, you, know, well, you have to do it numerically, but you know that it has evenly spaced things as you go up in, in energy. And then it's got some interesting dynamics. So is it possible you could do the tough model? I guess it should be possible. Yes. I, I mean, that would be a real yeah, challenge because that. that because the tough model has a tough paper. Yes. Uh, yeah, he has some gap equation. I think that he solved. Yeah, well, I mean, we, you know the spectrum. It can be done very accurately. It has a lot of properties that are sort of QCD-like. Uh, in I mean, it's like the large n limit, okay, of QC, the imagined large n limit of QCD, right? Um, yes. But it's still two dimensional. So, um, I mean, the next question: Could you try to do a large n QCD? But that that would require now. Um, two two separate variables S and T. That's yes, yes. So that would be like it. I want to discuss tomorrow, but yeah, no, we cannot but I mean, do large NQCD, but, the, the but thing, there is some interesting research. But you see, in a planar approximation, only two channels have singularities, right? Yes, yes. So it, it again is a simplification. I'm not saying it's not it'd be very hard, but any progress you would make there would get a little bit closer to the old bootstrap, and it'd be interesting to know whether these extra conditions come close to constraining it? Yeah, I mean, there is a recent paper by Rastelli, Leonardo Rastelli and one of his students, and um, they do a plot um, like similar to this for um, large NQCD, and there is a kink in, in that plot. And they think maybe that's large in, NQCD. I, but, I don't know uh, about this paper. So what's the paper? They have a paper on large N? Uh, yeah, I'm going to discuss a little bit tomorrow, but it's for it's Rastelli, uh, maybe a can... Okay, let me use that's a That's a step. Oh, I see. What? what well, okay. I'll get the... I'll get... Okay, they did it. So I want to look at the paper. Yeah. Good. Uh, somebody there knows, okay, then we can do yeah. If not, I can Google the reference. But... I mean, right, because, you know, the, the string theory was under the assumption of large N without knowing the word N. <laughs> uh... Yes, and that looks like something we can look up and look into in the discussion section. There's still another five minutes if you want to. Um, uh, I'm just uh, one of the uh, things to end your lecture for today is uh, you see fit. Uh, I know, I'm just trying to show the, this is, uh, this is a paper I was saying, uh, bootstrapping pines and machine. Um, I was going to mention it, I'm not going to discuss it in the, 
in the the talk tomorrow, but here they have um, uh, yes, this uh, kind of kink uh, in the coupling. So they use the coupling like in the effective theory, and they have a kink, and they say, well, maybe this is large in QCD, but I mean. I mean, it's still like the. Anyway, it's nice that they can have this type of plot with the allowed region. I'll take a look at it. I mean, the interesting thing is that the Veneziano yeah, model for the for the four pi on state. In fact, it was originally what the Veneziano model, the simpler segment Veneziano was supposed to be pi on scattering. And if you only look at the four point function, it's very accurate for the first, you know, n resonances. Yes. So it, it would it would have to be very close to the nervous shorts model before people realize that you should do it in 10 dimensions. <laughs> yes, yeah. I mean, the four-dimensional version of the nervous shorts model was actually for pions. And if you put the pion at zero mass, the roll looks very good. The make the all the spectrum looks extremely good, actually, uh, for long ways. So you know, you would really be interesting. You, you'd have to shoot close to that because we know that is close to the answer. If you know, right? Yes, yes. I mean, it's not analytic, but it's um, damn close. Has no ghosts. It's fine. It's a truncation. I mean, I realize it's not string theory, but it's a phenomenological model of tremendous accuracy. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, tomorrow I'm going to discuss a uh, pion scattering, but uh, yeah, we don't have like. Um... I mean, the beta uh, function automatically gives you the chiral constraints of Adler zeros at n equals infinity. It's the, the actual nervous shorts model, as I say, screwed up. You put the pion at zero mass, the row comes at, a, at the right mass. It has the soft pion theorems automatically built in. Uh, sorry, the row comes at the right mass by doing what? Sorry, by... Well, it, I mean, it's, it's a, it, it's a, it was a miss. It's not interpretation as a string theory. In fact, the original paper by Nervous Schwartz as a theory is a thing for pion scattering. Okay, and you just yes. change the intercept so that the pion becomes a zero mass state. Then you discover that the intercept for the row is exactly a half at t equal to zero, and then you get trajectories. You have one parameter, the uh, the the string tension, but uh, and then you can even go to the six point function. You don't see any ghosts at this level because you can't see all the states. I mean, you can only factorize and, and get a li limited information. But in that sector, it is an extremely good uh, description of the low sector uh, mm -hmm. with one parameter, basically. And, and as I say, it has Adler zero. So it's actually consistent with the chiral model at n equals infinity where there's no loops, right? So, you know, you would. You'd have to get very close to that um, because it's fairly, well, if, it's, if you're going to get the physics we think there is at n equals infinity. <laughs> right? Yes, yes, yes. So, um, and uh, it has planarity because it's the beta function. So, I mean, you could shoot at that. And if you could get that, you would have sort of um, derived the original reason for the nervous source model. <laughs> Yes, yes. Okay, I don't know some of the things you are saying. That sounds very interesting. Yeah. No, it's a reason, a very, I mean, as I say, if you look at the original paper, because they didn't know anything else. The time, Veneziano paper, yes. I, no, no, Nervous Short's paper ah, ah, says, Nervis I want to make a theory of pion scattering, and they introduce um, what now we consider fermions and, and supersymmetry, but, and they, and they, of course, didn't know any constraint on the intercept because they didn't have that information. Yes. Uh, they didn't know about uh, critical dimensions and so on. And then if, uh, if you look at the phenomenology, it looks extremely good as a low energy phenomenology. Okay, yeah, I should look at that. Yeah, so, no, I've been know, reading you, all those old papers. Yeah, just look at the original paper. It's all about pion scattering. I don't know if they yes, noticed yes. in the paper that it had Adler zeros, but subsequently it was noticed. Okay. Okay, yeah, I should look at that. Yeah, well, we're using basically the use the experimental phase shift to try to match, but uh, it's better to have something analytic. But this is zero. This is exactly meromorphic. That's the added information. Yes, yes. One more question before we uh, run out of time. 
Um, so in your diagram, whenever you had kings, it uh, corresponded to an integrable system. Right? Well, it seems to be like that, but uh, yeah, I don't know why that's the case. Yes. But in the paper that you just showed, uh, the king in that did not correspond to... A... Ah, uh, okay, yes, yes. So no, this... Uh... The kings are not clear why they are there. Uh, one idea is that the king just corresponds to some actual theory that exists there. And so you are shrinking the bounds, but you cannot shrink it more than that because uh, you have an actual theory there and it doesn't matter if it's integrable or not. But we don't have any any idea of why the, sometimes there are kings and sometimes there is not. So. Yes. There is also integrable theories where there is no king and actually here in the, are you seeing my slides? Yeah. Uh, for example, we have a, ma a reflection matrices. Uh, you can do the, the same for reflection matrices and you can find a whole line, well, not particularly plot, but let's say a whole line of integrable theories uh, so, so there are many different cases. So you could have a full line of integral series. You can have integral series only at the vertices, or you can have vertices which are not integrable. Yeah, we don't know exactly when there is a vertex or not. Might be nice to understand that. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thanks, Martin. Um, are you? Intend to wind down at this point. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So uh, thank you and. Uh...